it isn't obvious to me, and I think maybe I derived this criticism from Nietzsche, but you know, people have asked me whether or not I believe in God, and I've answered in various ways. No, but I'm afraid he probably exists. That's that's one answer. <laughs> um, yeah, no, but I'm terrified he might exist. That that would be a truthful answer to some degree, or um, that I act as if God exists, which I think is I do my best to do that. But then there's a real stumbling block there because there's no limit to what would happen if you acted like God existed. Yeah, you know what I mean because. I believe that that acting that out fully I mean maybe it's not reasonable to say to believers you aren't sufficiently transformed for me to believe that you believe in God <laughs> or that you believe the story that you're telling me you're not you're not a sufficient you're not the way you live isn't sufficient testament to the truth. And okay. people would certainly say that, let's say, about the Catholic Church, or at least mm. the way that it's been portrayed, is that with all the sexual corruption, for example, it's like, really, really, you believe that the Son of God, that, that, that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, and yet you act that way, and I'm supposed to buy your belief. Mm. And and it seems to me that the church is actually quite um guilty on that account because the attempts to clean up the mess have been rather half-hearted in my estimation. Yeah. And so I don't think people, people don't manifest, Christians don't manifest this, and I'm including myself, I suppose, in that description, perhaps <laughs> um, don't manifest the transformation of attitude that would enable, that enables the outside observer to easily conclude that they believe yeah. Now the way the way to deal with that or the way to to understand that is that it they do but they do in a hierarchy. There's a, there's a hierarchy of manifestation of the transformation that God offers the world and we kind of live in that hierarchy and those above us hold us together you would say. And so in the church there's a testimony of the saints. There's there are stories. There are hundreds and hundreds of stories of people who live that out in their particular context to the limit of what it's possible to live it. And even today, there are, there are saints, living saints, who, for example, like in the Orthodox tradition, we have this idea of what they call it the gift of tears or the joyful sorrow of, of people who live in prayer with weeping, constant weeping. Uh, and it's this kind of strange mix of joy and, uh, and sadness, which they, which kind of overwhelms them and they live in that joy and sadness nonstop and they pray, you know, without end. And so that exists, but then we, in this, th that's one of the reasons why, that's kind of one of the reasons why, when I talk about this idea of attention, like it manifests itself in the, in the church as well, is that you often say and I understand it when you say something like, you know, I act as if God exists or, you know, I, I'm afraid to say that God exists. Uh, and I think it's because you you think or you tend to think that the moral weight like of that is so strong that you would we would crumble under it, that you would just be crushed under it. And and I, I think that, that, that and I think that that's I think that I I, I understand that. But. The first thing that, to act as if God exists, let's say it this way, to act as, as if God exists, the first thing that it asks of you is not a moral action. The first thing that it ask, asks, asks of you is attention. That's why to act as if God exists is first of all to worship. Like that's and it. And I know people are going to hear this. Well, then say, I okay. have a, then I have a terrible problem with that too at the <laughs> moment because I'm in so much pain. Like one of the things that one of these theologians discussed the idea of. And sorry, I want to let you get back to your point, but he discussed the idea of the yoke of Christ being light and that there was joy in it, and um, and there's a paradox there, obviously, because. It's it's also a take up your cross and follow me sort of thing. But um, the fact that I've been living in constant pain makes the idea of joy seem 
um, cruel, I would say. And so, and I have no idea how to reconcile myself to that. I mean, I've reconciled myself to that by staying alive, despite it, you know, um, although by staying alive, despite it, but there's very little worship. And it doesn't mean I'm not appreciative of what I have. I'm, I'm not only am I appreciative of what I have, I do everything I can to remind myself of it all the time. And so does my wife. I mean, she's changed quite a bit as a consequence of her struggle with cancer, you know, has mm. become much more overtly religious, I would say. And, you know, we say grace before our meal in the evening, and it's a very serious enterprise. And it always centers around gratitude, you know, mm. for, well, for, for the ridiculous volume of blessings that have been showered down upon us at a volume that's really quite incomprehensible. But despite that, um, well, let, despite that, I'm struggling with this because I don't know how to reconcile myself to the, to the fact of constant pain. Yeah. And I don't, I feel that it's unjust, which is halfway to being resentful, which yeah. is not a good outcome. No, I, I. I agree. And it, I can't speak like I can't, I don't know how to speak to that because I don't necessarily don't have that experience. You know, I don't, I, I, I don't have that. I don't live with constant pain. And so I don't know what that would do to me. It'd probably, it's probably one of the reasons why it might ruin me, you know? And so, um, it's very difficult to answer that. I think that the answer, like the answer has been the cross, like that's been the answer. It's an easy, maybe it may be easy for me to just say it that way. Uh, but that's always been the answer of, of Christianity, which is that, that God went to, to the cross and that God went down into death and, and plunged down into death. And there are, that there are mysteries hidden and they're maybe they're very well hidden, but there are mysteries hidden in that than that depth. Um, but uh, it's not. I don't think it's my job to uh, to to moralize to you at this at this particular moment. I've seen. Sometimes the objective world and the narrative world touch. You know, that's Jungian synchronicity. Yeah. And I've seen that many times in my own life. And so in some sense, I believe it's undeniable. You know, we have a narrative sense of the world. For me, that's been the world of morality. That's the world that tells us how to act. It's real, like we treat it like it's real. It's not the objective world, but the narrative and the objective world touch. And the ultimate example of that in principle is supposed to be Christ. But I don't know what to, and that seems to me oddly plausible. Yeah. Well, but I still don't know what to make of it. It's too, it, partly because it's too terrifying a reality to fully believe. I don't even know what would happen to you if you fully believed it. If you believed in the story of Christ, or if you believed that history and and let's say the narrative make meet, let's both. Say. I yeah. think I think you because when you believe that, you buy both those stories. You believe that yeah. the narrative and the objective can actually touch.